Um, thank you, Mr. Kirkos. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Hélène conway Mouret. Uh, she is a member of the Senate of France, uh, responsible for uh, representing the constituency of French uh, citizens living abroad. And she's also the director of the International Department of the Jean Jaurès Foundation, one of the organizers of today's conference. Hélène. Well, first of all, I would like to tell you my pleasure to be here. I love coming to this country. The last time I was here, I came as a junior minister for foreign affairs in charge of the French diaspora to announce the coming of the French president and Laurent Fabius, who followed shortly. And as a uh, former university professor, this is one forum that I particularly like uh, not being of the same opinion, but being in a position to confront them and be able to move forward together, and I think that is very important. So what I'll do in the few minutes that, uh, that I have, I will go from uh, global to uh, local uh, issues and um, to try to articulate maybe some proposals for a plan of action in order to move forward, because I believe that we cannot be spectators of our own destinies, but we need to be actors of it. In the two years that I was um, uh, junior minister and now as a senator to represent the French living abroad, and I salute some of them who are here in this room, um, my task is to uh, travel a lot and uh, meet them and during those trips and the meetings that I have had uh, with either my own um, citizen, French citizens, and others, I've come to realize that uh, the world is not multi, well, it's not bipolar anymore. I'm not sure it's multipolar or zero polar. I think everybody has a role to play and that we're all interconnected. There is no escape anymore. I mean, we're all following the American elections as if they are our own elections. And somehow they count as much. And I think it was very well said earlier uh, by another speaker. I've also come to realize that the question of refugees, borders, <clears throat> and migration uh, is a central issue. In fact, I believe that with climate change and world demographics, I think that today migration is certainly the third biggest challenge that we have to face. And for us, progressists, I think we have a major role to play in these challenges that we have to meet because somehow they shake our own democracy systems and they put them into questions. It was said a few minutes earlier and I share this view that uh, we are seeing the end of an old world and the new one is very slow to come and I think maybe we have this opportunity to decide what our future, what our destiny will be. And we have solid bases, we have constitutions. We are not born citizens, we become a citizen. And we become a citizen based on normally the constitution that we have, the norms and values that are being passed on to us on different texts. And it's on those bases, solid bases, I think that we need to rely today. Because, um, and it was uh, said earlier, that we're observing the same phenomenon everywhere in this interconnected world. We're witnessing the rise of the anti-system movement. Donald Trump is the best example of that. We're seeing the rise of populist and nationalist parties. We're seeing also civilian actions we had the Zandinier in France, and we had the same phenomenon in Spain. These civil movements, this music, I thought it was here with me <laughs> in this machine. No, it's, it's a nice music. Um, civil actions that are the expression of the lack of trust in the traditional political parties, but also somehow a defiance in politicians. We're seeing the rise of the extreme right very strongly in Europe, but also right-wing parties that are becoming more and more conservative. 
And one example is the Brexit. We had David Cameron, a Conservative MP, um, Prime Minister, who somehow on the back of Europe made a promise, an electoral promise, that he will actually call for a referendum, which is something that is not done in the UK. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to get the UKIP votes into his camp. And on the back of Europe, he did that, and now we have the result of it. Maybe that's a lesson for other politicians in Europe to learn from. But the Brexit was not just won on sovereignty, it was won on the immigration issue. And I have to tell you that as a representative of the French abroad, of course, my planet, actually my constituency is the planet, it's, it's, it's big, but I go to the UK, of course, quite a lot. And the French people there have been reported um, remarks, racist remarks against them. These people have been living there sometimes for decades. They have adopted English accents, but they're still seen as being French and therefore immigrants. And it's the first time that they felt different and victims of racist comments. So the Brexit, this is that as well. It is not wanting the other, being afraid of the other. And with weaker economic growth, with less job pro, uh, prospects, with the rise of poverty, and also some hard middle classes being under, uh, under threat. The right-wing parties in Europe and the extreme right-wing parties are surfing on fear, fear of the other, that the other, the immigrants, are going to take your jobs, they're going to take the social benefits, they're going to take the housing, they're going to have so many children in the schools that the level is going to go down. Everything is put on the back of the immigrants. And it's that fear that is instilled in people's minds that we all have to live with now, today. We have, in France, the rise of the extreme right party, the Front National. And a few days ago, I was talking to some people who uh, were telling me that they live in the center of France. I'm not too sure that they have a single immigrant in their village, in their small village. But they're afraid that they might come because they saw pictures of immigrants storming trains, storming buses on their way to Germany a year ago. And those pictures are still in their heads. So it's that fear that we need to, um, to be fighting today. Because a year later, it's still there. And of course, the reaction of Europe was what? It was to build walls, to build barriers. The first reaction, it's normal. You want to protect yourself. Therefore, you feel that the physical wall is going to be that defense. But it's the walls that are being built in people's heads that are, I think, for me, the most dangerous. It's the fear of the other. It's the other that's behind that wall you don't know anymore, you don't want to know anymore, and you're not knowing him or her. After a while, you become suspicious of what he may do or he or she may be. And it's this division which is a paradox in this world where we're all connected. We all have thousands of, well, maybe not thousands, but dozens of friends on Facebook and all of that. And yet, it's a virtual world, so we are protected, we're okay. But we have this problem now with the real one where we have all these walls being built. The lesson we have to learn from what has been happening with the not the invasion, but the coming to Europe of thousands of refugees, is that Europe was too slow to respond and that Europe cannot cope on its own. I think that's the biggest lesson that we need to draw from it. We are at the start, I think, of major migration to come. The world population is going to increase. Africa itself is going to have its population doubled in the next 30 years. We also have climate change, and we know that there are a lot of people along the coastal areas in their countries that will have to move. We have these migrations today that are mainly within the countries themselves or within the continents, but they will be one point, and it's not just 
what's happening in Syria, of course, that pushes people to flee their country because of the war that is in, in it. It's these other phenomena that are going to be forcing people to move. And where will they go? They will go possibly north to Europe, which is still a place of peace and prosperity, because a lot of them are just wanting to have a normal life, while others just simply want to live. And there is something that we do not talk enough about, I think is that today, and I did uh, some work in the Senate over the past six months on human trafficking. You have to know that today, after arm and drug trafficking, human trafficking is the third most lucrative criminal activity in the world. Now, these migrations somehow are also encouraged by people who make money out of these poor people who are traveling. So I'm coming to my plan. I think we need to, um, no, that's not my plan, it's the wrong page. <laughs> Before my plan, I just have to go to the question of Turkey because I was um, a good uh, student, you know, taking each of the points that you had uh, given us. <laughs> Where does that all leave us? It leaves us with, of course, Turkey and the Middle East, but also North Africa being part of the solution. Um, in 2014, 200,000 migrants crossed the Mediterranean. In 2015, more than 1 million did that. We have, uh, that was reminded, 11 million Syrians, but we also have Afghans, uh, people from Sudan, people from the Eritrea coming to Europe. Now, the response of the European Commission was to set quotas. And that was one way of checking the generosity of a lot of countries, or the lack of it. Then the, um, the other solution was to restrict mobility within uh, the Schengen area and re-establish re controls at borders. Now, none of them are not only satisfactory, but I think they are the worst solutions that can be presented, because they are challenging one of the pillars of what Europe is about, that is the free mobility of its people. In March 2016, an agreement was passed with Turkey. Now, it was based to guarantee the security of migrants and break down the crimi crimi criminal networks between Greece and Turkey. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of it. I think you have mentioned uh, the best part or the most important part of it. But the result at the end of the day is that we went from 200,000 refugees going between Turkey and Greece in 2015 down to 25,000 uh, in 2016. So I think we can challenge indeed the way the agreement was passed and so on but somehow it is one route that has been blocked. But what has happened? Well, these refugees are not taking that route, but they're going back on the boats, unfortunately, with nearly 4,000 people who have drowned in this sea. And I don't think that today we can watch this, and that was said by the first speaker, and I really share that. I am ashamed that in France, this big country that has 36,000 towns and villages we have received 30,000 refugees. And today there is a movement um, that has been brought again by the right-wing uh, uh, parties to ask mayors to refuse to host these asylum seekers. Now, that's less than one refugee per French town and French city. I am ashamed of that because I think that at the same time, and I was talking to somebody from Jordan who is possibly in this room, Jordan, out of his six million people, has today 1.5 million refugees. The Lebanon is the same with a tiny population. Tunisia has more than a million refugees coming from Libya. And the continent of Europe, with its 500 million inhabitants will not be capable of having, you know, what Germany has done, over a million refugees or more. Now, among those refugees, we're talking about people who are fleeing war, 
And the Syrian people that I met in Calais, I spent some days there um, working with some uh, NGOs and associations. All they want is to be able to go back to Syria when the country will be at peace. They're not coming to invade Europe. They have come because they cannot live any longer in their country. It's war that has pushed them away. So I think Europe, and France in particular, which is still the country of <laughs> the human rights, have a duty to first to provide a refuge for asylum seekers and to also help with humanitarian help which I think, again, the international community is not at the level it should bring to countries such as Jordan or the Lebanon. We need to go back to the uh, source of the problem. And I will be now coming to the role that I believe Israel has to play. First of all, I think that um, we need to find political and diplomatic solutions to the conflicts. Now, in September, last September, our Chief of Staff, uh, General de Villiers, was explaining that um, while, of course, uh, uh, an, arm, um, uh, an armed conflict um, needs the intervention of the army and so on, that it is only temporary and that is never the solution. The solution has to be political and it has to be diplomatic. And this is the strength of Europe today. We do not have a defense policy. France has been very militant and pushing to have a defense policy for Europe. It has never worked. The only country that was linked to France was the UK. And if the UK comes out, I don't know what will be left. So we cannot count on Europe to have military action outside. But Europe can be good and can be strong. Indeed, had diplomacy and sending the very uh, good diplomats that we, have, that we have to do that. The second point is about the COP21. It was a diplomatic success. Israel signed it, as the other countries. And this is uh, to uh, fight climate change. I talked about all these migrations and forced migrations because of the climate change. That's one way of being directly implicated and active in trying to make this climate change um, a, a bit less under control. We need to cooperate and exchange information. And I think that Israel has possibly one of the best intelligence network uh, and intelligent people working in that area. And we need to dismantle the criminal networks um, that work today and uh, are in charge of these big movements. We need long-term planning. We need to stop just reacting and making policies on the basis of what's happening. I think if we do articulate a vision, if we are capable of seeing where we're going, if we are loyal also to our own values and principles, well, maybe we will be a little bit stronger in showing more solidarity. And I applauded. Um, Matteo Renzi, when he said he was going to refuse the Italian contribution to Europe if Italy didn't get more help. I don't see why Greece and Italy should be the only countries that will be fending on their own while the others are refusing to get a few refugees. And I'm talking of some of the newcomers that benefit greatly from the EU today, but are not capable of showing any solidarity or being generous with the rest of uh, the continent. We need to have the courage to face up reality and to stop pretending that if we wait long enough, the problems will go away, because they never do. And today we have put in place, and indeed it's quite good, Frontex, which is capable with a hotspot to do the work of being able to uh, meet the refugees and uh, welcome them in a proper fashion that needs more um, financial aid. And I will end to say that um, I was talking about it last night, I think, to some people at the dinner. I, I feel that somehow one of my favorite, favorite books uh, is from George Orwell. It's 1984. I don't know if some of you have read it. If you haven't, I really encourage you to do it, because it's a fiction that has come to be real. It's history being rewritten all the time. 
It's having an enemy yesterday that is your ally today, and you don't know, maybe tomorrow it will be your enemy again, but this is happening, and somehow Turkey is one example of, you know, with Russia. The plane comes down, the two countries have big tensions, and then a few months after, President Erdogan goes to Moscow, and they are best friends. All of that, all of that is very disturbing for people. We don't know where we're going. We don't know whether you know we need to be allies with them. Maybe they are our enemies the next day. And um, I think Israel is the only democracy in this region. And I will just end with that. Uh, it has the duty to be a role model for the others. I think it is the proof that peace can be achieved even if it is in, an, in a hostile environment. And again, the first speaker reminded me of this fabulous country which is made up, and it's probably why it's so thriving and doing so well, because it has all these people coming from outside with all these talents, competences, different cultures, different languages, and it's the mix of all that that makes Israel a country that can go forward, that should not be afraid of the other, and that should not be excluding them, and maybe that should be building more bridges than walls. And Martin Luther King uh, once said, um, human beings will have to learn to live as brothers, or they will all die as fools. So I hope we will all remain brothers and sisters, and I thank you for your attention.